Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Hey, listen! All right, you guys, podcast time. Make it so. It's me, Mario. I'm Batman. Strong am I with the force. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? You're a wizard, Harry. And welcome to World War G episode 151. I'm Troy. I'm AJ. Okay, uh, so usually we start out with a little list, but first, this time... We've got a taste test. We do. Um, For all you 90s kids out there... um, You'll you'll remember uh, from Rugrats, uh, Reptar Bars. Yes, Reptar Bars. Um, yeah, so how, how did you come across these again? Um, so we talked on the podcast uh, a couple weeks back about, um, Reptar Bars coming to FYE, an, an FYE near you, and so I had to go in, and they didn't have any in stock, and I had to place an order, then purchase them, and then come back a month later when they gave me a phone call. <laughs> right. Know, my dealer called me up and said, right. like, hey, hey, I got some in. So then I came in and picked them up. Um, yeah. Well, as you can see, and we're, we're, we're filming this, so you can go to our Facebook page and check these out. As you can see, the, the wrapping here, the wrapper is very, very, uh, very 90s. It is. I like how on the back it gives you three instructions. It says, one, tear open. Two, chomp. Three, roar like reptar. Yep. Yeah. All right. So these are green frosting filled milk chocolate. And, okay, the cool thing about it, like when you watch the cartoon, is they always talked about how it would dye your tongue green. That right. Was a, so I feel like if it doesn't live up to expectations, I'm going to be very disappointed. Although, I, oh man, this is like Willy Wonka. <laughs> All right, let's open these up here. Oh, my God. Ooh, it's oozing. Mine kind of busted open. So as you can see, normal, normal chocolate. And on the inside, this kind of green, gooey stuff. I don't even know if I want to read the nutritional facts. I don't think I do. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what that green crap is? Yeah. All right. Oh, you're just going for it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Chocolate's good. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's decent chocolate. The filling doesn't have that much of a distinct taste. Oh, it doesn't. I was expecting some sort of I don't know, maybe a lime or some sort of flavor, but there's not a whole lot there. I'm kind of moving it around my mouth to make sure that it coats my tongue. You can tell that these were um, these were rushed out quickly. <laughs> they were, they, yeah, definitely. These uh, they didn't take really take their time. My tongue green at all? A little bit. A little bit. Oh man. Not like you know, obviously not like the cartoon. No, not at all. Um, but speaking of cartoons, I compiled a list together of ten uh, foods that I would have loved to have seen. You know, grow that we w- that we would have loved to have seen growing up. Oh yeah, yours is yeah, yours is kind of green. I'm really green. Oh, that worked. Um, so number ten is Garfield lasagna. Whenever I think of uh, lasagna, I automatically think of Garfield. Yeah, um, you know, on the on the cartoon, they made la- the lasagna seem. It, it was drawn so it looked really good. Yeah, it really was. And then like he just pick up like chunk after chunk and yeah, just throw it in his mouth. In his mouth, yeah. Yeah. Um, number nine, Slurm from Futurama. Mm-hmm. I was like Fry's favorite drink. Yeah, I. 
I have always pictured as kind of a mm. thicker, kind of a Mountain Dew. Yeah, slurpy. Yeah, snack. kind of an, an, maybe an energy drink type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, number eight, the legendary donut. Okay, I know that they've come out with this on The Simpsons, and they did. Seven Eleven had a whole thing going on for quite some time. Seven Eleven, by the way, still has those donuts. Really, the pink donuts with the sprinkles. I, I feel like they didn't do it justice, though. Much like this Reptar bar, it was kind of lacking. Um, I think it should have been made by Krispy Kreme. Hmm. You know, because those, man, it's like cotton candy. Those, yes. Like those fresh out of the oven. Yeah, they're they're amazing. Number seven, Shaggy's legendary. I'm, everything's like legendary. Jeez. Okay, Shaggy's legendary stack sandwich. I would even say along with that, I would say uh, Scooby Snacks. Oh, as that's well. that, that's that's further down the list. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> but no, I. You know those sandwiches? They were like a couple feet tall that then he'd like compress down like an accordion. Yep. And then just they'd just stick, slam them back. Yeah, stick the whole thing in his mouth. But it had like every meat under the sun that you could possibly imagine, and cheese, and just oh goodness, I would have loved that. <laughs> um, number six, Ron Stoppable Nacho. It was basically a taco and nacho combined. That I have vague memories of. Off Kim Possible? Yeah, I didn't watch a whole lot of Kim Possible. I did, but that was because I thought she was hot. She was a cartoon crush of mine. I was going to say the cartoon character or the actress that played her? Both? Both, yeah. Yeah. Um, Number five, Jawbreakers from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Mm. I, I distinctly remember in the cartoon, one of the episodes, where they're rolling them along the floor, or, or like along the sidewalk, Yeah. and it's like picking up all sorts of gnarly looking stuff, and they just still just like throw it in their mouth. Throw it in their mouth, yeah, and then their cheek would expand like three feet. <laughs> yeah, it was it was awesome. Yeah. Another cartoon I didn't watch all that much. Um, that was the same time as like Courage the Cowardly Dog and some of these others. Right, Johnny Bravo, mm-hmm. Nature's Lab. Yeah. yeah. Um, number four. Krabby Patty. Yes. It was it was simple but elegant. Yeah, it's just a simple hamburger. Uh huh. But With pickles and man, it looks good. It does. They, especially the bun. Yes. It looks like I'm serious. Like you know how they'll do with bread. Sometimes they'll take a um brush and brush it over the top with some butter. Oh yeah, some way to do it. A, yeah, right. And it just looked amazing. Uh, number three, like we talked about, uh, Scooby Snacks. Yes. The closest thing I think that I imagine what they would taste like is like a Teddy Graham, mm. right? Yeah, but it was always confusing whether or not Scooby were Snacks for- were <laughs> dog food or not. Uh huh. Because I don't know, were the snacks named after Scooby Doo? They were. Were yeah. they called Scooby Snacks to give them that extra energy? But then they would also give, uh, and he'd pretty much do anything for a Scooby Snack. Yeah, but like a con- like a Klondike bar. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'd do some unforgivable things for a Klondike bar. I would kill somebody. Number two, it's addicting, right? These Reptar bars, like, they're not that amazing. Well, I'm just, I wanted to taste the, the green goo just itself. Yeah. And just that by itself tastes like cake frosting. Hmm. So that's actually pretty good. It, I, it's the chocolate that doesn't quite mix. They don't go together, yeah. Uh-uh. No. Um... Number two, gummy berry juice. Mm, mm-hmm. I, I watched, like I pulled up on YouTube just this morning, uh, the theme song that they had, and it was like a, a pound, like an, uh, right? No, 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 not oh, that. Not, not they that actually theme. have a legit song for just the gummy berry oh, juice. Oh, do they? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And they like tell the, ingre- the ingredients. I'm like, well, why are you singing this? Like, then they're going to figure out what it is, <laughs> and those trolls are going to make it. And we'll have all sorts of problems. Um, and number one would have to be TMNT's, uh, Michelangelo's, his pizza concoctions. Mm. Yeah, he came up with some weird ones. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote down a couple of them. Uh, they had like another YouTube video where it had like about 50 different ones that they'd come up with. And it was all the Ninja Turtles, but especially Michelangelo's were pretty creative. It was clam and, uh, marshmallow. Pepperoni and hot fudge, and who can get, forget such a favorite as shredded coconut and sweet pickles? Yeah, yeah. I don't know the marshmallow, the pepperoni and hot fudge. That doesn't seem on a pizza. Uh, that of all of them, that one may be doable. Yeah, 
clams and marshmallows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And those pizzas were always drawn, and they looked so much better than real life pizzas. <laughs> they were, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's. Um, actually, we were going to take a break here, but let's just go into our reviews. Sure. So, since we did Captain America, our movie commentary last week, uh, we haven't been able to talk about a couple movies that we saw. Um, it's been a couple weeks now. So, you, like, when we talked off the air, you're like, it felt like it was a month ago that yeah, I saw this movie. I thought it's been a long time. Um, only the Brave. Now, this is a story about the Granite Mountain Hotshots. Now, if you don't know what Hotshots are, they are firefighters, basically, but kind of, they explain them as kind of the SEAL Team 6 of firefighters. They're very specialized, and particularly stopping wildfires. Yeah, they'll even start fires. You know, you got to fight fire with fire. Exactly, yeah. And well, they'll stall, um, create one just to burn out enough in mm-hmm. an area to where it can't, the fire can't leap and continue on. Yeah, and and just looking at at what they do, you think, oh, that's kind of simple. No, it's not, because you really ha- you got to watch the weather. You got to watch where the wind is gonna go because it can shift and move and change on you, just like just like on a dime. Um, and they really kind of show how difficult that job is so well well, that and i was gonna say like even the fire itself some of these fires that get huge they actually create their own basically like weather yeah right i mean it's it's their own yeah they kind of do yeah yeah um so this this movie stars uh well the two big names that you'll know is josh brolin uh and miles teller um, which I'm I'm starting to come around on Miles Teller. Uh, I used to really not like him. You know, he was Mr. Fantastic in the horrible Fantastic Four movie. He was in he he's done a few like teen or early adult um, romantic comedies and nothing really interesting. Right. This one he's actually interesting. Um, he plays a kind of a new recruit to Josh Brolin's uh, Hotshot team. And, and he's the hot shot of the group, kind of, <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's it's based off of a true story. And I've said before, if you know, when when I was talking about American Made, how I judge um, a movie if it says it's based off a true story, if I immediately after I get out of the movie go and research it and look up right. the actual story, yeah. which I did on this one. I got out. Fairly accurate? Yeah, and immediately got on my phone and looked it up, and yeah, it was pretty accurate. Because the one of the, or, or the character that Miles Teller plays was a consultant on this movie. So he was there. And he was, he was helping them, you know, go for authenticity or for, you know, yeah. what it was really like and that sort of thing. I'm and sure that, they had to go through some rigorous training as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they did. And I was actually listening to interviews with Josh Brolin and Miles Teller and the others. And, and Miles Teller was saying that Josh Brolin kind of treated it like it was almost a boot camp for the younger actors. Okay. Because... You know, he didn't he didn't like let them at like in between takes go and like hang out in their trailers or anything. You know, he, he had them take equipment and haul it upside the mountains to for the crew and everything. Oh jeez! And to me, that just sounded freaking annoying. Yeah, like back off, Josh Brolin. Right. <laughs> Get off my back, Josh Brolin. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, and you can tell that that camaraderie that they had did come through everybody had good chemistry um uh oh some of the other actors that are in here that you will know is uh jeff bridges uh andy mcdowell and uh jennifer connelly mm-hmm. um that's a pretty good cast it is it is a yeah. really good cast <clears throat> and it's you know it it kind of it, it made me a little emotional 
Yeah. Towards the end there, yeah. I have to admit, I, jerker. Yeah, I shed a few tears. Um, Looked around to see if anyone was watching. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't care. But yeah, so so know that going in, it it's a very emotional movie. Um, but it's 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 good and and. You know, I I didn't know that these hot shots were a thing. Like I had no idea. I'd heard I'd heard of like smoke jumpers, but as far as like hot shot guys, yeah, I yeah. didn't know either. So it was interesting to learn that aspect uh of of that that job and that that occupation. So out of out of 5 um forest fires. Mm well, I'm trying to think if anything else stuck out. Uh, yeah, let's go with that. I'm I'm probably at three. Okay. Yeah. Pretty solid movie. Yeah. It was uh, it was good. Go and check it out, um, but be be prepared to probably cry. Yeah. So. As of late, I've been kind of relying on Rotten Tomatoes and leaning on them a little too much. And I was thinking, you know... How dare you, says Hollywood. Right? Well, uh, <laughs> well, whatever. Like, I'll look at a movie, and if it's between two, I'll kind of see which one has better reviews and go with that one. Yeah. Because you know? I, if I'm going to pay money, I want to see a decent movie. But there was one movie, uh, The Snowman, that just recently came out, that I was just like, oh, no, you know, I know better, even though Rotten Tomatoes says it's at 8 you know, every film critic said this movie sucks. Yeah. Despite yeah. that, I'm just like, but it, it's got Michael Fassbender in it. It's true. Uh, right? Oh, man. So, okay. Michael Fassbender does not a good movie make? Not at all. <laughs> yeah. He disappointed me with Assassin's Creed, and now this one? What the heck? Just stop making movies. Or do so. I don't know. Um, this one is about Detective... Harry Hole investigating the... Hang on. His name is Harry Hole? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, is, isn't it kind of like... doesn't take place in like Sweden or someplace like that? It, do, it does, yeah. Okay, so it's like Harry Howell or... Yeah. yeah. Harry Howell? Or... So it does, it, yeah, probably. Or just Harry, Harry Hole. <laughs> Hi, my name's Harry Hole. Okay. <laughs> Whole, whole, Harry. Okay. <laughs> Here, present. Like, Fair enough. Oh, okay. Investigating the disappearance of a woman whose pink scarf is found wrapped around an ominous-looking snowman. And in this movie, Michael Fassbender's character, because I want to say his name again, uh, he <laughs> he plays this alcoholic, and he had a very rough childhood growing up, which with some traumatic experiences, and so that, I mean, it, it's understandable why he's taken to the bottle, but he finds him he's a detective that gets away with a lot of things because of who his, uh, who his uh, stepfather is, mm-hmm. and he's kind of relied on him too much to... To st- keep his career going, even though, like, he should have been let go, like, years and years ago. Yeah. Um, but, it was, it, this movie just drug on. It was like, even though it was like an hour and a half, it felt, oh, well, actually, uh, two hours. It, it drug on. It was way longer. Like, the, even the tense or the scary moments weren't all that, like, interesting. And I was so disappointed. See, it's interesting because if you look at the preview, it almost reminds me of the preview of the uh, first Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Yeah, or like like it Strangers or something. Yeah, it's like it's it's kind of a cold, you know, um, a murder mystery. You know, it's 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 set in winter and and it's snow everywhere and and which already kind of makes it kind of bleak and. I mean, adds to the environment that like that aspect of it was kind of cool, as well as um, and no one wants a dark, cold, hairy hole. <laughs> That's gonna be the gift that keeps on giving this rest of this episode. Um, yeah, it was it it was not good. So I'm I'm sorry for ever doubting you, Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Please forgive us. 
baby come back <laughs> <laughs> um out of five snowmen i'm sitting at like one Ooh. if that ouch cold <laughs> <laughs> I know that, that's a cold review. But. All right, all right. Uh, so next, um, a movie that we've both seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw it late, late, late last night. Yeah, at twelve thirty, actually. So um, today. So yeah, early this morning, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then you saw it yesterday too. Yes. All yeah. Right. Thor Ragnarok, mm-hmm. the latest of the Marvel movies. Um, this one sees Chris Hemsworth retor- return as Thor, Tom Hiddleston return as Loki, and this time we int- we are introduced to Hela, played by Kate Blanchett. Um, and basically, Thor has got to stop Ragnarok from happening, which is pretty much the destruction of everything. The destruction of Asgard, the the total annihilation of the Asgardian people, all of that. That is what Ragnarok is. Um, and if you know your Thor history, uh, Ragnarok happens every uh, it's like five hundred thousand years or something, or I don't remember some ridiculous amount of time. Amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, Ragnarok would happen, everybody would be destroyed, they would be reborn, and they would start all over again. So, um, the Thor movies have never admittedly been our favorite. Yeah, true. Uh, and I think a lot of people would say that. Be- because I think that they've had, like, weak... Well, besides uh, Tom Hiddleston, they've kind of had weak villains. Yes, and I mean that's the same with a lot of Marvel movies, but Thor, I don't know, it it was that character's always been kind of boring. Mm-hmm. Always been kind of one note, one dimensional. Mhm. And this one, they changed it around. This one they went for a comedy. They went for something like um Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. You know s- a bit of a humor to it. Um which was really a lighter mood. Yeah. But I mean Quite refreshing. And I saw some of the clips and I thought, well, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, this it's weird to see like Thor and Hulk cracking jokes and, and stuff like that. It was that. weird, like even on screen, to see the Hulk talking. Yeah. It took me a little bit to get used to that. Yeah. Um, but it it works. Mm-hmm. For this movie, it, it works. Um, and... I will say this though. One one of my only complaints with this movie is that there are times where they don't quite balance the humor and the seriousness yeah. quite well. I, or well I, I would agree with that. They um they played uh, like they didn't have to use a joke in certain situations or it was kind of like more of a exactly yeah, yeah. like scene where it wasn't necessary and they threw it in there and yes. kind of shoehorned it in yeah um i did however like that like in the trailers you see that his hammer gets broken yeah. he didn't rely on that anymore because like we were talking earlier where he's a one dimensional character he's always relied on his hammer to get him out of like any tough situation and this one yeah, he, he can't. He can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it 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 sees Thor after his hammer gets destroyed. Uh, he ends up on the planet of Sakar. Mm-hmm. I think it's called. Yeah, and it is run by Jeff Goldblum's character, uh, who was really weird. He was kind of bizarre. He he seemed out of place. I like I think I think that was just Jeff Goldblum being Jeff Goldblum. Mm-hmm. Like I'm pretty sure all of the stuff with him was just like filmed in his house. Like I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> in his pajamas. In his pajamas. His weird pajama with flip flops on. Yeah, and so, uh, and Jeff Goldblum's character, and I say that because I can't remember his name, uh, the Grandmaster. Mm-hmm. He holds these gladiatorial competitions. And so his scavengers, you know, go around and find all these, you know, fighters and combatants and then have them fight for people's amusement, basically. And that's what ends up happening to Thor. 
And uh, we've all seen it. The trailer, mm-hmm. you know, the one that he fights is Hulk. And Hulk makes an appearance. Um, and then he has to get out of that situation and then go back to Asgard to stop Ragnarok from happening. That's that's the plot in a, in a nutshell. Um, it's... Like I said, it, it's it's really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really entertaining. It's really oddly lighthearted. It is, yeah. A lot of people die, but somehow it's lighthearted. It's strange, <laughs> and they die in some crazy yeah. ways too. And some He's people impaling, like tons of people, yeah. and a few people I didn't think would die. Yeah, like met their end real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's those. Oh, ooh, oh, uh, they're dead. Uh, yeah. Well, All right. Well. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but yeah, and and this one, it really does take the Marvel universe, at least in Thor's universe, and just completely flip the script on it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's completely changed now. Oh, it has. After yeah. this, a new look and a new Thor. Mm-hmm. Um, you get a. Uh, cameo from Doctor Strange. Yes, yeah. Which was fun. It was it, fun to see him again. It was pretty cool. Um, and you're introduced to a few new characters. Uh, one of which was Cord, the, uh, the, <laughs> the rock monster that, that apparently was from New Zealand. And that had a really weird voice. Yeah. Like, oh, hello, guys. Yeah. We had a really high voice, you know. Yeah. Hey, man. Hey, and and he's just—it's funny because he's like this nine, ten foot rock monster, and, and <laughs> it was weird. But he was funny. Yeah. Um, and it was. I really, I really enjoyed it. Other than you know, it had some issues with trying Ooh. to decide what it wanted to be, mm-hmm. whether really. The leave the dramatic parts dramatic or make them a little lighthearted or not that sort of thing. Oh, that one, the ball scene, you know, where he's trying to exit. Oh, like he throws. Every, yeah, every he time throws, that he yeah. tries to like exit on a like a high note, or he's like his timing was off completely yeah, yeah. throughout the whole. I mean, it, it worked, but yeah, it was it was off. It worked, but I I think it. I don't know because that's never been. Who Thor? Thor. Is. No, you know. Yeah. He's never been that kind of weird, clumsy, uh, do-gooder hero. I mean, it's, it's it was strange. Mm-hmm. It was a strange beat, but it it works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It was just a strange way for him to go. So, uh, out of out of five, I don't know. We want to throw hammers. In there. Hammers. Yeah, you could do that. Um, I'm probably at three and a half. All right, I'm I'm like barely at I think at a three. I mean it, really? it was it was good and all, but it it maybe it was perhaps it was just that I wasn't expecting so much like so many jokes and yeah. so much humor in it that it went all Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, you know, but. Yeah, um, I'm sitting at it about three. Yeah. Like I said, it's the best of the Thor movies uh-huh. for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, and and I don't. I mean, is is Thor? Are those movies done? I mean, is that is that it? I mean, I'm sure we're gonna see them in like Avengers three and four and probably uh, Infinity, other times. Yeah, yeah but Infinity. I don't know. I think for that that might be it. The way they ended it, it might be it. Yeah. So, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Uh, so, there you go. Definitely go see Thor. Uh-huh. Mm, you can pass on the snowman. And uh, go see Only the Brave if if uh, you're not afraid of letting people watch you cry. So, uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we got... All the news. All the news. All the news. So we'll be back right after this. Are you feeling nostalgic about your music listening needs? Do you like the tonal quality? 
that only a record can provide. Then go check out Lavender Vinyl, located at 123 25th Street, Ogden, Utah. Yeah, go talk to Kylie or Blake. They have a large selection of new and used records. Uh, they will also buy your old records. Maybe the ones that are just sitting up there in the attic, gathering dust. And if you can't find anything, they'll be more than happy to pre-order it for you. Now, you can always find them at lavendervinyl at gmail.com. You can also check out their website, lavendervinyl.com, or give them a call on the phone, like a normal person, at 385-240-0336. Be sure to tell them that World War G sent you. Now back to the episode. And we're back. Okay. With it being Guy Fox Day and, you know, the 5th of November. Which you heard at the top of the episode. I uh, felt it only appropriate to have a story about the 12 best graphic novel ad- adaptations of all time. A lot of the times we forget or don't realize that these... You know, like, that they were either a... There was an original movie or where they got the source material from. Right. So, without further ado, number 12, V for Vendetta. Can you believe that came out in 2006? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I, yeah. It, it still holds up in my in my mind. I watch it every 5th of November. I actually remembered that it was Guy Fox Day when I woke up, but forgot when it was, like, September 11th. <laughs> but, but yeah. Well, if they had, like, you know, if they had a catchier saying or something yeah, yeah. to remember that date. That's the curse of being a geek, I guess. I guess it's the cross I bear, Troy. Right? Yep. <laughs> uh, number 11, Ghost World. I'm not too familiar with this one. Um, here. One of Scarlett Johansson's first acting gigs. Have you seen it? I never have. Yeah, no. no. I've never seen it. But on every list that's kind of like that, uh, it, it appears a lot. Right? Um, they, and they said that they had to stay really, really close to the source material. Otherwise, it wouldn't have that same effect that the graphic novel did. Right. Where a lot of them, you can kind of stray away and do your own thing. This one, it had to be pretty much verbatim. Yeah. Uh, number 10, Hellboy. Man, that's a great movie. Thanks, Del Toro. We, I think we all know your feelings on Hellboy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number nine, The Crow. Now, if you're not too familiar with this one, this is basically, um, how do they describe it? In the Oh, Kurt Cobain and Bruce Banner. Because he's a, if you haven't seen this movie, okay, the title character is a dead rock, um, dead rock star brought back to life to seek vengeance. Uh, with e- equal parts Kurt Cobain and Bruce Banner. Or <laughs> Bruce Wayne, sorry. Yeah, and that's basically in yeah. a nutshell what it yeah. is. It's kind of an interesting one. Like, I, I don't know. But, and, it, and it definitely is a little bit dated now. Uh, number eight, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. This one, what's that kid's name? For some reason, I can't stand that Michael actor. Sarah? Yeah. Yeah. I'm with I, you. I, I don't I, like him either. I feel like he just walked on to like a movie set one day, and they're like, "Hey, do you, do you want to be in a movie?" Uh, all right. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. I, I guess I'll I'll be in a movie. I, I don't know. I, I... <laughs> he seems so scatterbrained and not in a good way. No, he, and he reminds me so much of like Jesse Eisenberg. Yes. Right. I, I get those two mixed up all the time. I'm like, oh yeah, you were in social. No, you no, you weren't. You, oh yeah, you were in. No. Yeah. Uh, that did you like that movie? Um, Scott Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very much, uh, and uh, I hate to say this, but it's it's kind of a, a hipster geek movie. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, hey, look how look how clever we are, and and the name of our band is Sex Babom, you know, like Mario. <laughs> yeah, like, everything's video games. Uh, they tried a little bit too hard. It annoyed me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it annoyed me. Uh, number seven, A History of Violence. Um, I This is another one that I haven't seen, but after, like, you know, I, I'm probably going to have to go back and watch. Apparently, it's it's really violent. <laughs> How about that? Right? Go figure. 
Um, number six, 300. This one, to me, kind of set a trend in Hollywood with going stylized graphic. You know, when they think of graphic novels, they think of this kind of a style. Which yeah. Which almost could deter a lot of people, but that's not the case in everything. But I thought the first one was decent. The second one was horrible. Yeah, it wasn't that good. Was just, I couldn't even make it through. I fell asleep watching it. Uh, number five, old boy. Um... This guy that he's kind of a drunken dude. This is uh, based off of a manga. I did actually watch it this morning because um, I wanted to see what it was all about. And it is subtitles, but it he he's imprisoned. Like, right off the bat, he's imprisoned in this place for uh, 15 years. And while there, he tries to, like, escape. It kind of reminded me a little bit of, like, a longer stay of V for Vendetta, you know? Um... Natalie Portman's character, where she's kind of trapped, and so then she, you know, she finds that strength within, and right. he, he starts, like, exercising, and yeah. like, like, the first while, he's just kind of, like, pitying himself, and why am I still here, but then he, like, turns it and seeks revenge. It's really pretty awesome. It reminded me a lot of, like, some of Jackie Chan's earlier stuff. Well, and the interesting thing with Old Boy is the guy gets basically kidnapped, mm-hmm. thrown in this room... And he for he doesn't know why, and he's in there for how long did you say? Fifteen, 15 years. years? Yeah. yeah. And he starts putting those tattoos on his arm, like yeah. making his own homemade tattoo to keep track of years at least. Uh, number four, you'll really love this one. Or you've probably seen this a couple of times, right? Or to perdition. Uh, I've Tom seen Hanks. it. I know. I've actually only saw it once. Really? I've only seen it once, yeah. It was a good movie. It was really was, good. It was really good, yeah. I can't believe it came out in 2002. Yeah, I was working at the movie theater the first time yeah. when that uh, came out when I was 16. Wow. Uh, this is a newer one. Like, for all these other ones where they're a little dated, this one's uh, Snowpiercer. came out mm-hmm. in 2014. Um, kind of an indie Sundance film in the beginning, but then it kind of caught on. Um, it is kind of a hipsterish film and like a interesting take on, you know, society and hierarchy and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's definitely one of those films that has an agenda. Um, and it's not afraid to throw it in your face. It is not. No. (laughs) Uh, number two, one of my personal favorites, like seriously, uh, taught one of my top 10, uh, Watchmen 2009. Of course. Yep. Yeah. Which they're actually, I don't know how I feel about this. They're thinking of redoing it. I've heard that, yeah. There, there, there's talk, but... I think it's going to be that. like a, they say, Netflix series or something like that? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned. <laughs> All right. Um, and number one, Sin City. Another stylized graphic novel novel adaptation. I really like the first Sin City mm-hmm. movie. A I, game to kill for, not so yeah. much. Yeah. Although, you know... Eva Green. Right. You know, that wasn't bad. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that that's about all, all I had going for it. That movie was uh, not good. But Sin City, yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. It was yeah. a pretty solid movie. Yeah, the first one is really entertaining. Um, okay. Um, so. Continue. Okay. Um. Really quickly, I did want to mention some of the other, like, just a couple other ones. That yeah. I feel like should have been on that list. Uh, Atomic Blonde was a great movie. Have you seen that one? I haven't yet. John Wick esque. Actually, but. I actually totally forgot about that movie. But yeah, it's with uh, Charlize Theron. Yeah. Theron. Uh, Tank Girl, Kick Ass One and Two, and Edge of Tomorrow, which is based off of a, a another manga. Um, all you need is kill. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, both of those, like the manga as well as the movie, that was one of the few ones that I li- I really liked of Tom Cruise. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. solid. It was like a groundhog, super uh, futuristic Groundhog's Day. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right. Well, here's kind of some big news. If you're a uh, cinemaphile, if you're a movie fan. If you're one of those film nerds sitting in film class dissecting, 
you know, the films. <laughs> um, what do you get when you put together Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, Harvey Keitel, and Al Pacino? An awesome movie. That's what. On top of all these incredible icons, you also have an Oscar-winning director, Martin Scorsese. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's happening. According to reports, Netflix has successfully secured its rights to what is shaping up to be the most anticipated films of the decade. They shelled out $105 million in order to have the right to The Irishman. And let's be real here, people can't wait to see this. Uh, it has been reported that the deal will allow Netflix to share the film to not only their 9 million subscribers, but what is also what will also boost their subscriptions. Uh, apparently, Netflix started nego- the negotiations with Scorsese shortly after Paramount Pictures dropped out of the project. According to the Daily Mail, a spokesperson noted that Scorsese's films are known to be a risky deal. <coughs> Excuse me. And Paramount does not typically take risks. By joining Netflix, he is able to do the film that he wants. I think this has an awesome cast. Although, you know, I mean, going uh, off of a sports analogy, a lot of the times when they try to buy a championship, it doesn't always work out so well. Moneyball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to do, but. I mean, they've got the they've got the cast for it for sure, and the director. But you don't think they'll tr- be trying too hard to make it something? You know what I mean? Like when they when it just comes off naturally, it's it's great. It makes for a great movie. But when they go in trying way too hard, yeah, it's like um, and go back to a sports analogy. Yeah, uh, it's like when the Lakers, you know, had that Karl Malone, Shaquille yeah, O'Neal, yeah, yeah, Kobe yeah. Bryant, all those, yeah. Uh, and they were trying to basically buy, buy a, a championship. It, mm-hmm. it does feel like that a little bit. Where, where it's kind of forced. Yeah. Uh, but hey, kudos for them for getting Joe Pesci. I thought he was retired, so... And this is probably... Re- Man, he looks aged. In that picture, he looks they, old. They all look old. He, he seriously... He could play a great penguin. Yeah. Right? He's got the nose for it. <laughs> yeah, and... <sighs> And I hope this is kind of a return to form for Robert De Niro. Mm-hmm. Because, man, he has not done anything really good in did, quite a while. Did he do the interview? Um, Wasn't that him? The the one that I like, the last one that I saw that I really liked of his, um, and this is like some time ago, I forget the name of his, his he had to take his whole family. Um, they had to go into the witness protection program. Oh yeah, him and uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer mm-hmm. were husband and wife. Yeah, I remember that. That one was I like, that one was decent. That one was but, yeah. Mm-hmm. Bad grandpa. Oh jeez. Oh. <laughs> With Zac Efron. My Robert De Niro, how far you've fallen. Mm-hmm. It's like he's almost doing like a Nicolas Cage, and like he'll just do whatever thing he's yeah. asked to do. Yeah. Um, the last good movie I saw him in, and I can't remember the title again, but it was a movie where he was traveling across the country to see his kids, played by, one was played by Sam Rockwell, and yeah, anyway, um, and it was kind of a, you know, kind of a feel-good movie, and I am so so, I enjoyed it. Cried again in the theater. <laughs> no, not in that one. Not in that one. Wait, that was one one where he was like kind of backpacking, right? Kind of. Um, I, th- I think he may have just been traveling across the country. Um, the Venom movie officially has begun production. There are a couple photos out there of Tom Hardy on set, and he just looks like. Tom Hardy, yeah, with a hoodie on, so he's Tom Hoodie. <laughs> uh, but um, people are kind of worried about Venom and and what exactly they're going to do with it. Well, apparently, it is going to be a capture creation. 
Uh, during a Yahoo News exclusive, actor and director, not to mention Caesar the Ape and Gollum Smeagol, Andy Serkis, let slip that Venom will be depicted using motion capture while explaining the technology's increasing importance in a modern film. He says, acting is acting. And the more actors, like Steve Zahn and Karen Konaval, who plays Maurice in War for the Planet of the Apes, the more A-list actors that come on board, like Mark Rylance playing the BFG, or a lot of actors in the new Marvel films, he said, before mentioning that, Tom Hardy is playing a new character using performance capture. While Circus doesn't come right out and say that Hardy's new character is Venom, it's hard to see how that isn't the case. The symbiote's abilities and versatility certainly lend themselves to mocap enhancements. And with the rapid rise in its usage, it makes sense that Sony and director Ruben Fleischer would opt to employ it in the film. Uh, written by Jeff Pinker and Scott Rosenberg, Venom is expected to hit theaters October 5th, 2018. Uh, I'm still looking forward to it. It's got one of my favorite villains and one of my favorite actors. So. See, I've it has one of my favorite actors. Yeah. <laughs> but I've never liked Venom. Really? Mm-mm. Ah, that's been like, one of my favorite like villains, especially when they went like with Carnage as well and those guys. Yeah, Carnage, I hated even more. <laughs> really? He's very because Carnage was okay. One dimension. That whole thing in the nineties. Nineties comic books were not good. They were very extreme, and they had they looked ridiculous with like mohawks and pouches and all that yeah. kind of crap. And Carnage came out of that era, and it it was just. It doesn't, that character doesn't hold up nowadays, mm-hmm. but I'm talking Carnage, not Venom. Yeah. But Venom, I don't know, he's he's always, he just wasn't very interesting to me. But, hey, prove me wrong. Yeah. You know, prove me wrong. Um, okay. So another thing that got the fanboys in an uproar. Uh, harassment and death threats from DC fans upset over Justice League's runtime. Oh, geez. On death Thursday... Threats. Yeah, death threats. <laughs> on Thursday, I found out that Justice League tickets would be going on sale this coming week and that theaters were given a routine or runtime of 121 minutes. Yesterday... I had two more sources confirm it to me, and even today checked with AMC's customer support, and they confirmed it's in Comscore Rentrack as the official runtime from Warner Brothers. But since DC fandom is so toxic, I've been bombarded with harassment and death threats ever since I said their superhero movie is only two hours long. This is the reaction DC fans are giving over the runtime of a movie coming out, threatening to kill me because I relayed the news of how long the movie runs. So he, he gets kind of a screenshot of um, some of, looks like either an email or something like yeah. that. Subject, and I'm going to censor this, F you, huh. message body. Thanks for telling everyone that Justice League is 120 minutes, thus disappointing millions of people, you a-hole. The way you went after this story shows what kind of fan you are. You are a f- oh, degrading, beep, 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 de- beep. degrading F word that has to do with gay people. Jeez. Oh, and you've been on the web for years, yet you know nothing. Know nobody and have, and have to beg for a story. You also have no fans. You are a loser, and I hope you suffer a lot. I hope you burn. The film will not be good. It'll suck like your whole life. There's wow. <laughs> there's no way... As he's messaging this, like uh, the police are knocking on his door. Yeah. There's no way they can tell a good story in less than two hours. You're an idiot if you think otherwise. Looks like you're a fat A, too, so you probably can't even... Oh, man. Screw your hideous fat wife. Send her over to me. I'm not going to continue that. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Want me to read another one? Yes. <laughs> Subject. Justice League is 170, you lying fat. 
<laughs> beep, beep, beep. Justice League is not two hours, you lying fat piece of S. Remove your fake news now or I'll hunt you down and drag your fat corpse through the streets. You lard A wouldn't know a good movie if it... Can't finish that <laughs> sentence. Oh. This is your final warning. Revoke your fake news or die. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> What are these people thinking? Like, seriously, have we strayed that far in society? Yeah, oh, and man. and this guy's name is uh, Jeremy. Jeremy has been active on the web since the 90s. He's written for sites such as IGN and Furious Fanboys. <laughs> well, they yeah, ironic. And even once worked on Star Wars Galaxies. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, he used to do a podcast about Star Wars with friends. Yeah, wow. Um, uh, what? I don't understand that sort of fanboy mindset mm -hmm. that just because a movie is doesn't 121 minutes... Or doesn't have the cast that you want, or doesn't have any... You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Isn't the way you would have done it? Yeah, that you... Send death threats, not not to not to the studio or to the actors or anything. Like that. No, 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 mm -hmm. to a guy who just happened to report it. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that that is the lowest living brain cell last in your head that comes up with that. Knowing that there's those type of people out there, does that make you hesitant with your YouTube channel to want to release more videos? Mm, no, no, yeah, no. So far, everybody has been... It's been positive reviews? Been fairly positive, yeah. 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 I'm not too crazy about some of the suggestions that people have now given me, but... Yeah. I really don't want to do the guys from Supernatural. Really? I really don't. But I ask for suggestions. They give me suggestions. What can I do? You gotta give them what the fans want, right? Yeah. Celebrity Tens on YouTube. Check it out. Uh... GameStop is offering a new service where they've been getting death threats as well. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Wouldn't be Game, surprised. Right? GameStop is offering a new service that will let customers rent a used game, play it as much as they want, return it, and then check out another title as often as they'd like. Uh, the deal, which has been confirmed by GameStop, was reported by Polygon. Uh, the new program is called PowerPass costing $60 for six months and allows customers to borrow any used game that GameStop has to offer. Plus, at the end of the six-month period, you'll get to keep whatever the last title you checked out was. Um, looking close at the fine print, the only catch out there is that you have to have a GameStop power-up rewards. Uh, you have to be part of the GameStop power-up rewards program, but you can do that and sign up for it for free. Um, this is actually going to be released coming out on November 13th, so just in a week or so, and it actually sounds like like a pretty good sweet deal. I don't like the fact that you have to sign up for it for six months at $60 a pop. Yeah. But that's the price of one video game to be able to play any of these new titles that are, you know, because typically what, what will happen, and I've, I've done this as well, um, okay, here's a little insight into GameStop, how you can work this, air quotes, work the system. Oh, hey. Right? If you... Rent. I mean, if you purchase a game that's used, you. I mean, well, a brand new game comes out, and within a week, there's typically a couple of copies that get returned. That people, there's like, ah, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Return, like, return it. So then it becomes used. You can go ahead and purchase that used game and play it. For, you have a week um, to play it, and then if you don't like it, you can actually return it and be refunded that money, hmm. or put it towards the purchase of another game, which, you know, there's probably another title that's come out, and so you can kind of continue to do that one until you find one that you want, and then you can keep that game. Huh. Interesting. Right? Um, so, but to have to, 
I don't know, $60 at, for six months. But then, like, I like the idea that you get to keep the last game that you have, that you're holding on to, but it almost makes you a little bit hesitant to, you know, I mean, when there's about a week or two left, you know, and you've got a game, and you're kind of, he- you know, like, a new big title is going to be coming out soon, and you'd like to you know, play that game, but you don't want to return your last one until you have your hands on that new copy. Yeah. I don't know. That might deter a, a few people from wanting to um, try to get the newest and greatest and latest. And I kind of worry that if there's quite a few people that are doing this program, all the used games are going to be taken off the shelf. Right. That makes sense. Mm. I don't think know. It, I think it's, I think it's worth it. I think it's GameStop trying to remain relevant. Yeah. You know, they're kind of the last gasp of a of a dying organization that's for video games cuz like well, well yeah brick and mortar going in buying or renting games you know mm-hmm. yeah that's true pretty much just them they they've kind of had to like branch out and you can purchase other things there yeah. you know t-shirts and like uh monopoly games <laughs> i mean it's still geek related stuff and also but. i mean they do you know uh you know what what we went to you know they do their um um premiere parties and mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So I think that's what's kind of been keeping them afloat. But it seems like they're 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 um trying really hard to remain yeah. relevant. Um I, I do like still hunting for a good deal on the shelves. You know, a lot of the and also I do like their I don't like it when you're selling games because they give you crappy like I mean they don't give you like anything. Yeah. You know, for your your game, but I do like occasionally finding. Oh man, that game's like twenty dollars when it's typically you know anywhere else is about like forty. Yeah. So I do like that aspect of it, and also the the people that work there, they're really knowledgeable for the most part. Um, they play like quite a few of these like games as soon as they come out. They each get a copy to play so that they can stay up to date with it. And here. <laughs> Here's the funny thing, and it keeps happening when you and I go out somewhere. Yeah. Like, if we go to, like, Gaming Con or, or Salt Lake Comic Con <laughs> or something, we'll be walking, and you'll see somebody, and you'll both kind of look at each other. Like, oh, hey. And like, hey, do I... Do I know you? Like, where do I know you from? You're like, GameStop? Like, yeah. oh, that's right. Yeah, you used to work there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Like, it's weird how much it happens. It, it happens more than I'd care to admit, but yeah, you're right. So, I I do like their attempt at it. I don't know. I don't know if I'd actually do that, but... Yeah, I don't think I will. It's it's not my... Not really my type of thing. Yeah. Um... Dan Aykroyd, uh, actor, alien believer, and skull bottle vodka purveyor, Dan Aykroyd, thinks his cinematic brainchild, Ghostbusters, should be revived again. This time as a live-action Netflix series, along with the lines of Stranger Things. The only current... Of course, he threw in Stranger Things. Of you course. Know what I mean? Yeah. The only current, current semi-hard plans for further Ghostbusters content involve an animated film that Ivan Reitman is helping to develop. Currently, there are no plans for a sequel to the 2016 Ghostbusters live-action movie reboot. Wonder why. Right. Aykroyd originated the concept of, Go- of Ghostbusters back in the day as a possible vehicle for himself and fellow SNL alum John Belushi and ultimately sold director Reitman on the idea. Aykroyd's movie about supernatural exterminators in New York City eventually came to screen screen with himself, Bill Murray, and Harold Ramis in the lead roles, and went on to become one of the biggest grossing films of all time. The belated sequel, Ghostbusters 2, was a decent-sized hit, but failed to satisfy die-hard fans. And afterward... Ghostbusters, as a movie concept, went on seeing seeming permanent hiatus. Uh, however, in 2016, Ghostbusters was revived with an all-female cast, an endeavor that led to an all-out internet uprising by outraged male fans. The rebooted Ghostbusters came up short at the box office, seemingly driving a stake through the heart of the movie franchise. Do you think that Ghostbusters lends itself well to like a TV series? 
I think that's what it should have been instead of the movie reboot. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, they could... Mm, there's some longevity to it. But there is. I don't, I don't know how long, because you can... Obviously, you can have quite a few different ghosts and them going to uh, different locations, and but unless there's some sort of like in Stranger Things, eminent threat or impending doom, you know. Yeah. But once you've already gotten to that point and you know finished it up in like a season or two and actually fought that villain, then I don't see it going any further unless you come across a bigger and badder threat. Yeah, I think maybe you could do kind of a, maybe a ghost of the week type of thing. You know, each episode is kind of a different type of ghost you have to battle. Maybe one night could be a ghost. Maybe the other episode could be like a demon, maybe. Right. Well, and and that's what I really liked about the first couple of uh, seasons of Supernatural. And that's where I fell off, you know, off the wagon is when they went away from that, because I liked all the folklore that they put into all these ghosts that they were fighting, you know, like the Tooth Fairy and some of these other, the Boogeyman, and that was, that to me was really interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, that could, that could be it. As long, as long as once they finish that up, they kind of wrap up the whole, you know, maybe a season, perhaps two. Yeah. I would say just keep Dan Aykroyd far, far away from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's, he, Yeah. He's not that funny anymore. Um, uh, we have we have our Shazam. What? DC's Shazam to star Zachary Levi. Um, Zachary Levi is going to be Earth's Mightiest Mortal. The actor will star in the DC comic book adaptation Shav- 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 Shazam. <laughs> Uh, which follows a boy named Billy Batson who can transform into an adult superhero by uttering the magic word Shazam. The name is an acronym of ancient world gods and historical figures Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, and Mercury. See, now you'll be good at the bar trivia if that ever comes up. Yes. From which uh, Batson derives his heroic attributes when in adult form. Do they actually ever do that at like trivia nights or oh, something? Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Geek Trivia Nights? Oh, yeah. yeah. David F. Sandberg is directing Shazam for New Line Cinema. The studio is high on Sandberg and sees him as a homegrown talent after putting out his first feature lights, uh, or excuse me, his first feature lights out in 2016 and releasing the Helmer's Annabelle creation, uh, the last installment in the Conjuring universe. The 15 million horror sequel has earned 303 million worldwide once opening or since opening in August. Um, Zachary Levi. The only thing I can think of that he was in is Chuck. Chuck. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's gone on and done a couple other things. I guess he was in Dark World and Thor, as well as voice acted somebody in Tangled. He's was he. He was Finn in Tangled. Was he? Mm-hmm. And in Thor, he was one of the Warriors Three. He was the blonde guy. Oh, oh, really? Fandral. Yeah. 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 Huh. I wish they would kill him. I know. Um. So we <laughs> we all remember Jar Jar Binks. Don't we? Begrudgingly, like I tried to put him out of my mind. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Well, Misa, remember him? Misa, remember Jar Jar Binks? Oh, that's pretty good. I, yeah, that's really good. Hey, well, it's what I do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's my mutant power. Uh, <laughs> Ahmad Best, who played the infamous Jar Jar Binks in the Star Wars prequel trilogy has spoken out against his contribution to motion capture being repeatedly o- repeatedly overlooked. Jar Jar really needs no introduction, as George Lucas' key, quote-unquote, to the Phantom Menace, the comedic Gungan became a poster child for fan complaints about Episode One and the rest of the prequel trilogy, from confused tone to iffy special effects. However, while Binks may now be a shorthand joke... Uh, that shouldn't supersede the character's important role in cinema history. The first fully computer-generated supporting character in any film. He was a major step forward in 
the uh, in the then new technology of CGI motion capture. Ahmad Best didn't just voice Jar Jar, but played him on set in a not-so-fetching approximate costume that served as a basis for the animators. It's not as high-tech as what we now have in Avatar and Planet of the Apes, but he is very much their forebear. Not that it's often recognized as such. Sorry, I still have to go with, like, Andy Circus. You know what I mean? Yes, but what I mean, or what they're Jones. saying is no. I, no, I get what he was saying. the first. The fir- yeah. yeah. <sighs> no, a circus has him beat hands down. Even Doug Jones. Yeah. Which I didn't even realize he was in a he was in Hocus Pocus. Doug Jones. Yeah, he played the um, zombie with the stitches. Was that Doug Jones? That was Doug Jones. I just never oh. realized that. Right. I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. I get what he's saying, and that was really... I mean, because you see all those videos where he's wearing, like, that weird-looking thing that kind of where his Jar Jar Binks head would be. Yes. And, man, he did he did a lot of leg work and a lot of the stunts. He did. But... That doesn't that doesn't take back that it was it was Jar Jar Binks, <laughs> and he's actually extremely lucky that that movie didn't come out like you know now, just because you know how many memes there would have been. Oh yeah, <laughs> like he probably would have been getting like death threats as well. Oh yeah, he yeah, unfortunately he probably would have been. Yeah. Um. No, but if if you have phantom menace on episode or on on dvd vhs <laughs> um i actually had it on vhs for a minute yeah go look at the special features kind of the making of and listen to what to what george lucas says about jar jar binks he says that jar jar is the key to that entire film he said if jar jar doesn't work then none of the film works so hmm. Old uh, old Georgie boy was all in on Jar Jar Binks. I, I guess you have to stand behind your creation. So, well, okay, I can see Gollum, you know, being the Lord of the Rings kind of mascot, unofficial mascot. Yeah, right. He was one of the unsung heroes of the whole entire movie. Um, so I kind of get where he's coming from, but. Jar Jar Binks was nowhere near that. No. And and that's the funny thing. Phantom Menace came out in 1999. Mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings came out just three years after that. Yeah. And look at the jump that was made from Jar Jar Binks to Gollum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's night and day. It really is. And even more so now from Gollum to Caesar mm-hmm. in Planet of the Apes. Yeah. It... It, it's crazy. And they're only going to improve. I thought they did a pretty decent job in Thor with the Hulk. Yeah. You know, kind of Mark... Ha- oh, what was his book? Mark... Ruffalo. 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 Yeah. Um, they, I thought they did a great job with that as well. Yeah. All right. Um, let's take another break. And when we come back, we got a few more stories, a few more news stories to talk about. Uh, we'll be back right after this. On the historic streets of Ogden, there are two kinds of people, readers and non-readers. Here's where you can find their stories. Booked on 25th Street, located at 147 Historic 25th Street, Ogden, Utah, 84401. Yeah, stop by and say hi to our friend Marcy. You can pick up a new or used book, or you can sell your own used books. That's right, you can get 10% store credit on what they can sell the book for. Stop in and say hi, or call them at 801-529-7720. You can find them on Facebook at facebook.com slash booked on 25th, or you can email them at marcy at booked on 25th.com, or visit their website, booked on 25th.com. Be sure to tell them that World War G sent you. Now back to the episode. And we're back. Um, one of the things that I love most is seeing what people like to spend outrageous amounts of money on. It, 
it's cool, and there are some items where I'm like, yeah, I could see, like, I mean, if I had the money, the excess money, yeah, sure, why not purchase that, you know? Mm-hmm. And then there's other things where you're just like, really? You spent, like, $10,000 on a pair of underwear? Like, right, yeah. That makes absolutely no sense. And this is the case with one of these. This one, this article comes from The Verge, um, and it says, Sometimes you have to go be a bit beyond Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace to sell your aging car. To help his girlfriend move her 96 Honda Accord, Max Lehman filmed his own fantastic commercial to find a buyer. Uh, like, it was actually, like, I watched the commercial, and it looks like a pretty legit commercial. He's got these, like... Scenic, she's driving along the coast. It's set to a piano score that's actually pretty decent. He's got aerial shots, which I'm sure they had to use some sort of a, um, what is, what is it called? What are those things? Cats in the car. Oh, she's making coffee. Right? She's yeah. doing everything. And it's, it's hilarious just because, like, it, it goes on to say that the viewers, this video has since gone viral with uh, just shy of 1.5 million views. Um, on eBay, the vehicle, get this, is going for, um, a hundred bucks, or a hundred thousand dollars. Like, Jeez. just a little over a hundred thousand dollars. And the vehicle itself has, um, over a hundred and forty one thousand miles on it. Yeah. So it's, and it's not like it's new at all. So, the thing. It's a 1996 Honda Accord. Mm hmm. Yeah. <sighs> Part of me is just like, why didn't I think of this? You right. Know? I, I had a, a 2002 Hyundai Accent. <laughs> I, had a, I had a 1992 Buick Skylark. Yeah, right? If you could have gotten like $100,000 off of it. Heck yeah. Yeah. I wish, I wish that YouTube was around back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I could have um, done something similar. But what I can't understand or I don't understand why somebody would want to purchase that and then just to say, like, look, I got the car that was advertised on this video. We, yeah, it, it's the same type of thing. <clears throat> I was just thinking about thing? this. Well, I was just thinking about this yesterday. Yeah. When I was working at the theater. You know how they they come out with those um, those buckets and uh, 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 commemorative cups? Right, for specific for, movies? Yeah, yeah. So I have one right there for Star Wars. Mm-hmm. You buy that in the moment because you think it's going to be cool. Like, right. oh, look, I'm watching the movie. I have I have the stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And then after, you never use it again. It's kind of an impulse buy. Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing here. Like, oh, this this car on this commercial, you know, it's gone viral. Or it's this really famous car right now. I'm going to hurry up and buy it and say that I have the car. Yeah. And then a year later, you're like, oh, I have the car. <laughs> what the heck am I going to do with this Stupid 1996 car. Honda Accord. Yeah, make your own commercial and try to sell it off. Right? Yeah, I mean it's, it's the same. It's the same it's type of thing. By, but I can't even imagine like spending that much money on it. That's like a decent. I mean, that's like a decent like down, like a huge down payment on a house. Like oh, half, yeah. a pay, <laughs> half a house. Jeez. Huh. Um. All right. So. There are a lot of, I'm sure you've heard them, that people like to compare the DC and Marvel movies, you know, and they generally say the Marvel movies, Marvel movies have it figured out, DC not so much. Mm-hmm. Well, there is one person that agrees with that, uh, Superman himself, Oops. Henry Cavill. <laughs> yeah. In the DC Cinematic Universe, before there was Batman, Wonder Woman, a Suicide Squad, or Justice League, there was Superman. And now even he admits that mistakes have been made with the current slate of DC films. By Superman, of course, we mean actor Henry Cavill. Cavill played Superman in Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and will also be in November's Justice League, the worst kept secret ever in Mm. movie history. He's a big part of the DC Universe as anyone. And an interview with the rake, um, Cavill Very says, <laughs> yeah, source. Cavill says the following about it. Even if Marvel didn't exist, we'd struggle. There was a style they, meaning DC, were going for, an attempt to be different and look at things from a slightly different perspective, which hasn't necessarily worked. 
Yes, it has made money, but it has not been a critical success. It hasn't gotten everyone that sin it hasn't given everyone that sensation which which superheroes should give the viewer that shouldn't be controversial since cavill is just stating some fairly obvious facts about the difference between how much money they'd have made versus how much or how well they've been reviewed it's always good to know that people involved in these movies haven't buried their heads in the sand about the reaction to them and yet Given the polarizing reaction to pretty much every film in the current DC universe, save Wonder Woman, has uh, engendered, he might be facing some blowback despite being entitled to his own opinion. He then points out um, about the most recent film, Wonder Woman. Um, he says, I think it's a wonderful time for a female hero. It is a perfect setting in social politics right now. We need it. We want that perspective. And Wonder Woman has struck at the ideal time and has become a phenomenal success, which is fantastic. Any success within the superhero universe, especially within the DC universe, is wonderful because I want to keep telling the Superman story. Selfishly, that works for me. Um, I, I do like that he is open and honest with it, and it it does seem pretty genuine, and that he can see that there has been, like, mistakes made. He doesn't, like, outright criticize, because he, I mean, you don't want to really, you know, bite the hand that feeds you. Yeah, he's not going on there and saying, look, here's the problems. Yeah. It's the writing, it's the directing, right. it's this, it's that. He's not going like, name a name. No. But he is saying that there's been mistakes made. And, yeah. Yeah. Which... It's it's so dang funny. Like, did you see the new trailer that they just recent? Like, did they just drop for? I did. Like, during third yeah. or Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. I mean, it already shows that like Superman's here, alive and well. Yeah. yeah. Um. DC, is there? And if the Justice League doesn't do well, is there any recovering for them? <sighs> I mean, they're still gonna make money, but. They're gonna be like limping along compared to. Marvel. Oh yeah, yeah. If if Justice League fails, that that might be the final nail in the coffin for for. I mean, they're still gonna be making movies, obviously. Yeah, but uh, um, Leonardo DiCaprio's Joker. Yeah, but, but there people aren't going to care. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna show up in droves like Ooh. they did with Thor this weekend. Oh yeah, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's, he's right about everything he said. You know, there was mistakes made. They were going for a different approach, a different perspective. A darker look. Darker look. And it hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. I blame Jack, uh, Zack Snyder. That's who I blame. Yeah. Yeah. For most things, not just these. For everything. For, global, for everything. War global warming. Yeah, global warming. Know. I burnt my toast the other day. I blame Zack Snyder for that, too. <laughs> so He's actually become a household swear word. Yeah. Stub your toe. Oh, Zack Snyder. <laughs> um, so, we've, over the years, accumulated quite a few trophies on the PlayStation Network, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so, now we're going to be finally rewarded for that. If you've gotten an impressive amount of PlayStation trophies um, constantly being added to your collection, you can finally put those um, accomplishments to good use by cashing them in for new games or other products thanks to the Sony Rewards program. Um, how much you'll get kind of depends on um, each trophy you have, but for those who rack up quite a few catalog, oh, let's see, quite the catalog, you should walk away with some easy money. Um, bronze trophies aren't included in the deals, but if you have silver and anything above, you'll earn more Sony rewards points the more you have. Um, here's kind of the breakdown. 100 silver trophies equals 100 points. 25 gold trophies equals 250 points. And 10 platinum trophies, which are a pain to get. I've yes. only got one. I was looking at my trophies, and I'm sitting at a 10, which means I've got one platinum, um, 18 gold, and like I, th I think like 80 something silver. So I actually have not enough for any of these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, 
Dang it, what the heck. Maybe I'll have to go play some more indie games where you can easily get 100%, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but to put that into perspective, uh, to see what you can redeem your points for, you can get started by linking your account on this website here. Um, and you can also, let's see, tracking your trophies. Having a 1,000 points is enough to get you $10 in PlayStation Store credits. Um, I was kind of going through and looking at my friends list and just seeing like where everybody's kind of sitting at. And yeah. there are some people that seriously have at least like, you know, 60, 80 bucks or so. That's kind of hmm. cool that they're rewarding you. But when they say that they're turning it, like you turn in your trophies, you still have them for your records purposes, right? I would think to, so, yeah. Right? And they just take what you're like back to zero. Yeah. I mean, I would assume. Right? Um... I think it's kind of an interesting idea. That then it, are you a trophy hunter yourself? Not really. Go out of your way if you if you get them. That's cool. If not, whatever. Yeah, the only games I can remember being really gung ho about the trophies only is yes. Injustice. No, oh. is the Arkham Asylum games. Oh, okay. the Arkham games. And it is kind of cool because you can look in, you know, go look at a walk walk through. Or even look at all the different trophies that yeah. you haven't unlocked just yet and see how to accomplish yeah. them. And I mean, and Joni, she's a stickler for oh, little the, little big planet. Yeah, and uh, those Lego games. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's all over those. I, yeah. she's completed every Lego game one hundred percent. Oh, geez, it's completely done. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that that I did. I did like because I brought over one of my controllers one time because there was a couple on Little Big Planet Three that you needed yeah. two controllers to complete. So I'm helping. <laughs> yep. Get those last couple of achievements. Yep. Yeah. No, that that's pretty cool. Um, I, I would like to see them also do something like this for the Xbox as well. You know. Screw those people. <laughs> They're not real gamers. Those disgusting Xbox players. Ugh. Ugh. Lowbrow, gap tooth. Trash bag. Might as well just go get a PC. Might as well, right? Man, they're even worse. Well, it's basically. I'm gonna be computer. started on that leper colony. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you just wiped out two thirds of our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I'm very sad. In general, that's it. <laughs> I saw this okay I saw this meme the other day that was hilarious it said like you know you're at a concert and then it said um the singer says how's everybody doing and you in kind of a normal voice in the back of the crowd is just like eh, it's been a rough couple of past months it's been a rough month <laughs> um Nickelodeon has they've cancelled the team, teen, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon they had going. Mm-hmm. Just upright, canceled? Well, it? it was only... I think it was only planned for about five seasons, so... Okay. It but it, it's... Of course. Yeah. I mean, it was one of my favorites. It's a great... It was a great cartoon. Oh, yeah. So, I'm sad about that, but kind of happy, but still kind of sad that, that they are... Preparing a new cartoon. Man, you're having a roller coaster of emotions over there. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm yeah, bipolar when it comes to the Ninja Turtles. Nickelodeon has officially announced the full cast for its upcoming Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon series. Cat Graham, the Vampire Diaries, and Josh Brinzer, Silicon Valley, have joined the show as April April O'Neil and Donatello, respectively. This finalizes the group that already includes Omar Miller as Raphael, Ben Schwartz as Leonardo, and Brian Michael Smith as Michelangelo. Um, Eric Bauza has also been cast as Splinter. Oh. While, uh, while Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will change several conventions from previous TMNT adaptations. The biggest of all seems to be that Raphael will now serve as leader of the team. Yeah, yeah! Oh, it's finally happened. I knew it would happen. While Leonardo will be depicted as the quote-unquote self-professed coolest brother. This incredible roster of voice actors provides a fresh take 
on these globally recognized characters. Uh, Chris uh, Viscardi, Senior VP Production and Development, Animation at Nickelodeon, said in a statement, they are going to bring this version of the Turtles to life in a whole new way. He also spoke about the direction the new series will go, explaining, We have reimagined the series to be filled with humor, loads of action, and a dynamic look. Yes, because they've never done that before. No, never. The series will also bring all new heroes, villains, and cityscapes for the Turtles to explore. Veteran voice actor Rob Paulson, who we've met, super cool dude, who voiced Raphael in the original 1987 series, and Donatello in the new in in the other Nickelodeon series, will be voice directing Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Miller commented on this by saying, uh, "To get to voice this fictional character." who had such a giant positive impact on my childhood, is an honor. And to boot, I'm being directed by the man who voiced Raphael in my childhood. Here, okay, so here... So I, I have really haven't heard any of the other, like, bit of the story, because I'm just kind of focused on Raphael as a yeah, leader. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, I'm in, sure. In, my, in my head, all I'm hearing right now, Troy, is just like, I've paid my dues <laughs> time after time. They've been finally I've vindicated. I've done my sentence, but committed no crime. We are the yeah. Um. So here's the official description of the voice act of the characters. Excuse me. Direct from Nickelodeon's press release. The highly comedic voice cast shapes the team in a fresh way and breathes new life into the characters' distinct personalities, including Raphael as the oldest and physically biggest brother. Um. This freaking could be... It just shot me back up to the top of the page. Yeah. Ha ha. <sighs> well, shoot. <laughs> and I can't get back down. Um, all right, look, if you want to read it, go to cbr.com um, and just put in Ninja Turtles, and I'm sure, sure you'll be able to find it. I'd love to give you the descriptions... <laughs> but my computer is having an aneurysm. What the shell? Currently. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, anyway, moving on. Ba- okay, so you already were talking about being sad and all this other stuff going on, you know. This is only adding to it. Insult to injury. Yeah, mm. yeah, pretty much. I don't know. I mean, it's weird that they're making Raphael... The leader of the group. Yeah. Transformed from the norm by the nuclear goop. Well, it could um, actually... <laughs> Some people out there got that. Yeah. Um, it could actually change the whole their whole dynamic because, you know, Leonardo has always been more conservative and erred on the side of caution, where Raphael's just going in head first and, like, you know, really impulsive. Right. So that that's where I'm thinking that could... Man, that's going to be difficult for, you know, Master Splinter to be like, hey, wait, no, no, guys, don't do that. You yeah. know, and they're just running in there, and he's like, come on. Like, but I I also hope that it's not going to be that usual trope that they do with the Ninja Turtles where Raphael and Leonardo, you know, butt heads. heads. Uh-huh. And it turns into a competition, and then just in the background is Michelangelo and, and Donatello, you know, making quips and stuff. Mm-hmm. Which they're they're kind of like the Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw of the group. Pretty much, yeah. Right? Yeah. And then, so, Leonardo would be Gryffindor? Yeah, yeah. And then Raphael would be Slytherin. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So, Michelangelo would be Hufflepuff and Donatello would be Ravenclaw. Absolutely. Yeah. There we go. Because the Hufflepuff just, are the losers. We just sorted the Ninja Turtles. We did. Into their proper houses. We should do that with other characters. See which house they would yeah. actually be in? Or yeah. Break, like the Avengers? Like which ones they would be in? Captain America would be in Gryffindor. Oh, hands down. Stark? Tony mm-hmm. Stark? I'm thinking. I want to say Ravenclaw because they're very like he's very intelligent. That's true, right? That's true. You Analytical. do. Yeah, you do have kind of the nerds over there. In Ravenclaw. Same, same with the Hulk. Yeah. Even though same with Bruce well, Banner. Okay. Yeah. The only problem is uh, Bruce Banner would be 
and Ravenclaw, but the Hulk would be Hufflepuff for sure. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Not very bright. <laughs> Who'd, would anybody on the Avengers be in Slytherin? Mm, see, I would see like Loki. Lo- Loki, I was just yeah, going to say. Right? Loki would be a really good Slytherin. Yeah. Yeah. Man, these would be like perfect questions to ask these guys to see which house they think that they would be in. About Justice League. Yeah. Justice League? Um, Superman, Gryffindor. Because, mm-hmm. you know, he's the goody two-shoes. Right. Uh, Flash would be in Hufflepuff. Yeah. Batman, Slytherin? Batman would be probably in Slytherin. Yeah. Either that or Ravenclaw, because he's really, you know, he's a detective at heart. That's true. Wonder Woman? I would see her being in Gryffindor, too. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. She she kind of reminds me a little bit of Hermione. Yeah. Kinda. She's kind of the Hermione of the group. Yeah. Um, Green Lantern? Mm. Nobody, he he kind of, he's like with Aquaman, kind of more Hufflepuff-esque territory. <laughs> They'd be in the Hufflepuff? Yeah. Yeah. Over there, way on the end of the banquet, banquet table. Yeah. Yeah. Never getting any house points. Just... Just kind of mm. there along for the ride. Interesting. Uh, Very interesting. All right. Um, well, here's where you can find us. You can listen to all of our episodes at worldwarg.podbean.com. You can also find us on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Just search World War G. On the social medias, you can find us at facebook.com slash podcast. Um, on Twitter and Instagram, you can find us by searching at WWG Podcast. You can also find our shirts and other merchandise at shop.spreadshirt.com slash World War G. You can also email us anytime. Day or night. At worldwgpodcast at gmail.com. So, this has been World War G episode 151. That has been AJ. That has been Troy. Stay Hufflepuff. My friends. <laughs> Nerd! Thanks, Joy. Hi, everybody. This is Sean Ray. And John Irons. And we're the hosts of Cosmic Potato, the Super Fan Talk podcast. We're a show that has a little bit of everything. Yeah, we talk about movies and TV and cartoons, entertainment news, and every show has a different theme. That's right. We might discuss anything from our favorite bad movies to who would win in a fight between C-3PO and the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was episode 41, a classic. Uh, you can download that episode and all of our other episodes on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, we're on Podcast Addict and, of course, on our website, CosmicPotato.com. It's special guests and movie news and geeky nerddom and nerdy geekery and lightsabers and Time Lords and Ninja Turtles all the way down. So check out uh, Cosmic Potato, the super fan talk podcast.